Welcome to Computer Science 320 2014 Winter 2 Midterm 2 Practice Problem Screencast number 6.7 and this one opens with the delightful phrase we'd never ask you this on a real exam because it's too tedious and time consuming but it is good practice solve the example problem by hand using the above dynamic programming algorithm notice that a much smaller example might be helpful in solving the next two more abstract problems Okay, well, I pity you for solving this problem by hand, but just so you know, I solved the problem by hand. How do you think I put together the optimal solution? Uh, I didn't pro program it up because it was faster just to solve it by hand and make sure that I had my algorithm right. So what I'm going to do is solve a portion of this problem by hand, and I'm going to leave the rest to you. So how am I going to solve this by hand with dynamic programming? Well, all I need to do is write out my table and then compute the pieces of my table step by step. So what I'm actually going to do is go back up a little ways here. I'm going to erase the commentary that I put off to the side of my algorithm because although this is a divide and conquer algorithm, it's not a dynamic programming algorithm, it has inside of it the core recurrence that describes this divide and conquer algorithm. And with that recurrence, I am ready to write out my solutions to the dynamic programming problem. So this is basically the recurrence. I want the minimum over all of the choices of the root of the left cost plus the right cost plus the additional cost. That is the best solution. So I'll just draw my table. Now, I need to know what my nodes actually are, so I've got even more copying work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to magically copy everything to here, and it will suddenly appear locally. The magic of editing. Okay, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven nodes, and I probably need low to go as low as one and as high as n plus 1, so it can go as high as 8. Um, I'm actually going to number from the top left here, and I'll have low be the vertical axis here. So this first row, for example, will be where low is equal to 1, and then 2, and 3, and 4. Oh my goodness. Five, six, I need more space. Seven. Uh, I'm not going to put an eighth row because I know if low is as high as eight, then the subarray that I'm looking at is empty, and therefore the answer is just a zero. So I'll go up to there, and I won't go any higher. And high is also going to range from one up to seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out the first entries that I will fill in. Um, the textbook likes to fill in entries in the array for the base cases. I like to use the solution check mechanism that we saw in class, where you just have a, a function that wraps your array so that when you look up a base case, then it returns the base case value and it doesn't bother to look in the array, and it can do that in constant time. One thing that's kind of nice about that is it means you can have weird base cases, like you can have uh, indices that sit outside of the array actually be base cases, and we use that in class so that we could have negative amounts of change take an infinite number of coins to produce in the change problem. So here I'm just going to assume I have a solution check, and my solution check does the right thing in the sense that if I try to see the cost of uh, making a binary search tree out of an empty list of nodes, that cost will be zero. So the smallest that I'm interested in is an array of length 1, and the array is of length 1 when high is equal to low. So this is high equal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so that's all along the diagonal of this array, from the upper left to the lower right. And that means we really don't need any of this stuff down here. We can just block it out as far as we're concerned. It doesn't need to exist. 
Now, if I were actually writing this as a piece of code, what I would do is just allocate a two-dimensional array. There's no point in working really, really hard to avoid allocating the rest of this array right here. Uh, and in fact, there are probably efficiency reasons that you shouldn't bother with such silliness. But conceptually, we can just black that out so that we don't have to think about it. And we'll start by filling in that diagonal. Well, how much does a one-node tree cost? Well, in a one-node tree, all you've got is the root. It actually is going to cost zero because the root is at depth zero. But we could do it with our recurrence relation. Our recurrence relation ought to work. It's down here. Okay. And it tells us, you know what, I'm going to clean it out a little bit so it's easier for us to see. I'll try and be really careful about this so I don't erase any of the text that we filled in here. Okay. Delete this. Good. So our recurrence relation is basically this part right here. It tells us we want the minimum over all of the subproblems that we're producing right here. The subproblems are all the possible indices of the root. Well, if our indexes range from, say, 2 up to 2, there is only one possible index of the root. The root is 2. Okay, so our loop will have only one iteration. And we'll look up the subproblem that ranges from low, so again, if we're looking at 2 up to 2, that's just 2, up to i minus 1, so that would be from 2 up to 1. And again, that is an empty array, so that's just going to return 0 automatically. And the second call is going to be from 3 up to 2, that's immediately going to return 0. So we'll get 0 for the left cost, 0 for the right cost, and then we sum up all the frequencies of all the nodes in the range, which is just that one, and then we subtract out that one node's frequency, that's also going to give us 0. So if we were to run this in our table, we will get 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals 0 for all of these diagonal entries. So I'm just going to fill them all in as zeros. They'll all work the same way. But then things get interesting. What about when low is equal to 1, and high is equal to 2, then we're working on this cell here. Okay, And in that case, we have these two entries in our array. Well, there's two possibilities for the root. The root could be uh, number 1, index number 1, which happens to be key number 1. Or the root could be number 2. And we have to try both of those. That's what our recurrence tells us. So if we try number 1, well, the left cost is going to be 0. That's going to be another case where we have an empty array. But the right cost is going to be the cost of the tree ranging from 2 to 2. And we can look that up in the array. The cost of the tree ranging from 2 to 2, that is the 2, 2 entry in the array. And it's 0. Now, admittedly, we could figure that one out pretty quickly. But as we get further and further up this array towards the upper right corner, going back and refiguring things out again is going to become really expensive and hard to do. So in this case, we get 0 back by a base case for the left one. We get 0 back by looking it up in the array for the right one, because i plus 1 is 2 and high is 2. So this is 2 comma 2 that we're looking up here. So that's 0 plus 0. And then we get the sum of all of the frequencies of nodes low to high. So that's the sum of the frequencies of these two nodes, which is 12 minus the frequency of node 1, which is the one we put in as the root. And that is 10, so we end up with 2 as our answer. So 2 is our smallest answer so far. That was kind of looking down at a subproblem, so we built up from this subproblem below in some sense. Now we'll build up from this subproblem on the left, and when we do that, well, of course, we're also going to get 0 and 0 still. Nothing's going to change there because we're still looking at a 1-node subproblem and a 0-node subproblem. But when we sum up all the frequencies and subtract the roots frequency, we're going to end up with 10 instead. 2 is obviously better. So the entry we want in here is 2. Hopefully that's a legible 2, but trust me, it's a 2. OK, so next up, we can calculate the next entry down the diagonal. And I am going to do that, but then once I've done that, I'm going to give up on the rest of the diagonal. And I'm going to calculate one more entry, which is entry the entry where low is 1 and high is 3, because that one will be at least a little bit interesting. And then I'm going to leave the rest to you.
Okay. So right now we're working on the entry where low is 2 and high is 3, which means we are only looking at these two nodes right here. And much like last time, that's going to come down to a choice between 4 as the root and 5 as the root, and it's going to turn out that the left cost will be 0 and the right cost will be 0, regardless of which way we divide. And the additional cost will just be the cost of the thing that's not the root. So the cheapest we can do again is to make the thing that's not the root be the node with the key 4, and that will give us a cost 2 solution. Now what about when we go to fill in the low equals 1, high equals 3 box? Well this gets more interesting because now we are looking at all three of the first three nodes, 1, 10, 4, 2, and 5, 7. We have three choices of root. If we choose node 110 to be the root, well then left cost is going to be 0. That's just going to be a base case. So when we go in to find the left cost, we're going to get it to be 0 because low will be 1 and high will be 1 minus 1 or 0. So we'll have length 0 array. But right cost, low will be i plus 1. That'll be 1 plus 1. That's 2. And high will be 3. So we're going to look up the answer in array entry 2 comma 3. And that was a 2. So this will come back as a 2. What about the additional cost? Well, it's the sum of all the costs of the nodes. Uh, that is, uh, if we look in here, that is 10 plus 2 plus 7, so that's 19, minus the cost of the root, so that's 10. So this is going to be 9 in this particular case. And altogether that makes 11. So far 11 is our best solution. So we can just record that our best solution so far is 11. Now, that's only our first stab at this. That's making 1 the root. Next up, we have to try making 4 the root. When we make 4 the root, our left cost is going to come back as 0. That's because it's going to be a one-node lookup. In particular, we'll be looking at this entry over here in the upper left, the entry where low and high are both equal to 1. And it's kind of interesting to note that last time, we effectively looked at, uh, I'm going to redraw that portion of the table so I can show you what I'm talking about. We have this portion of the table that looks like, I don't know, some sort of crazy Tetris piece. Okay. We're trying to compute the result in this entry right here. And first, we used this entry, and I didn't show it, but we effectively used this entry off the edge of the table. Next, we're going to use this entry and this one. And last, we're going to use this entry and this one. So there actually is kind of a geometric interpretation to what we're doing here. We're going along the vertical and horizontal lines, and we're kind of shifting how far along each line we traverse. And that corresponds to changing this splitting point, this i, because it changes the indices that we're looking up in the array. OK, so that's kind of cool. The geometry is kind of neat, but the truth is it doesn't matter that much. Here, we've got 4 as the root, so i is equal to 2. If i is equal to 2, i minus 1 is 1. Low is also 1, so we're going to be looking at nodes 1 to 1. That has cost 0. We already established that. And then we're going to be looking at nodes 2 to 2. Nodes 2 to 2 also have cost 0. That's going to be this 0 here and this 0 down here. So when we add to together those two zeros, we're obviously going to get 0. That sounds really nice so far. But then we have to sum up all the frequencies of all the nodes minus the root frequency. Well, the sum of all the frequencies of all the nodes is still 19. That hasn't changed. We already commented that that won't change as we go through the loop. But now we're subtracting off just 2 instead of 10. So 19 minus 2 is 17. So our additional cost is huge here. And it's large enough that 11 remains our best solution so far. So now we've got one more thing to try. We have to try making 5 the root. Okay, So we'll go through and eliminate what we've seen so far. If 5 is the root, the left cost is going to be looking up low, ranging from 1 all the way up to 2. Okay, So that'll be the entry where low is 1 and high is 2. That entry has a 2 in it. That's the really hard to read one, remember? So left cost is 2. Right cost, well, there's nothing on the right-hand side. That's going to be where low is equal to uh, 
uh, 4 and high is equal to 3. That's that's not interesting. So it'll be an empty array. It'll have a cost of 0. And the additional cost, as always, is going to be 19 minus whatever we put at the root. Well, we're putting 7 at the root, right? So 19 minus 7, that's 12. And so our total cost is 12 plus 2 is 14. 14 is also larger than 11. So the cheapest node to have at the root was 1. Now from there, we could go on and compute more values. So if you'd like to continue this example, I recommend computing this value next. And then just to keep things interesting, I recommend working up the array towards this entry at the top here. And that way you'll get lots of larger problems early on instead of having to solve lots and lots of small problems first. When you finally get this entry in the upper right, then you will have the solution to the overall problem.